I was actually going to give you an update on the commission. And then I, I, I was driving down here. And last week, I was at the Canola Council of Canada's uh, annual convention. And they have, uh, they have some new resources and some, some history because it's their 50th anniversary. And driving down, I was going through that. And some of the pioneers of the canola industry, because the canola industry is not that old, uh, are still, still around and still talking and telling fantastic stories about the people that were involved, the things they had to overcome, the challenges. That, and I thought, well, that my talk for today just went out the window. And in reality, it looked exactly like Darcy's, except you took pork out, you put canola in. We had this, a lot of the same activities. We worked with them and Rich and the wheat and barley pulse guys on a lot of the same things. We're facing the same challenges with social issues. Uh, you want to talk about that, you can go to our website, you can talk to me, that's great. But I thought, I'm going to tell some of this, some of this story, some of this history. Uh, and even, you know, Neil was telling me, sending me some notes about who's going to come here. He says, well, we have a captive audience because the third year ag and training people, third year agrologists, have to come to the convention, uh, which is great. Captive audience. Uh, but there are also you know, some relatively young folks coming into the industry and they might not know this. And it might come in handy about some of the relationships and how relationships with your competitors can help everybody go forward. So we're going to start with canola people resources and serendipity because stuff happens and sometimes it's good and it just happens and no one plans it and you can move forward and that sometimes helps contribute to your solutions. So you always got to keep your eyes open for watching to see if something just happens. So where does it all start? Uh, well, canola is a very old crop. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years. It's part of the Nebraska CRISPR family. So I know there are some crop people here, so you guys should know way more about this than I am. I'm an economist, so you're not going to see a slide presentation with pictures. There's going to be charts. Um, there's 350 genera in, that, in, the, in, the, in the CRISPR family. There's 3,000 species. It's the biggest interrelated family going out there. There's got lots of relatives, which is a really good thing for some of the problems that we have out there. Rapeseed, and we're going to talk a lot about rapeseed. And the word rapeseed is from the Latin for turnip. So just so that everybody knows where that comes from. It was a primarily, uh, it's an industrial lubricant. And it was one of the only lubricants available prior to the advent of hydrocarbons and the discoveries of oil. It was a major lubricant in the marine business because it's hydrophilic. Water, uh, steam doesn't chase it away. So it was really used a lot in marine, in marine applications, things like that. And then a couple of things happened. Um, we had some, some immigrants came from, uh, from Poland. Fred and Olga Slavoniuk settled in Shelbrook, Saskatchewan, and they brought with them some seeds, uh, or them or their neighbors. They brought some seeds and started planting in their garden. They had history with it. They used it in the old country, as they called it. And they started growing rapeseed, and they started selling it around and giving it around, passing it out to their neighbors. They were probably using it as a cold press fashion. Maybe they were using it in their machinery, in the steam engines, and the thrashing machines. Uh, they could have been using it as a vegetable oil during Lent. In some religions where you're not supposed to have animal products, so they could have been using it there rather than hemp oil. By the 30s, they were passing it around in tobacco cans to their neighbors. It was getting up there. Um, it was, in that part of Saskatchewan, it was usable. And that's part of the resource. Canada has 150, 160 million acres of land being used in agriculture. Uh, that's a lot of resource. Uh, we have water, just enough water from the sky to grow crops, this part north. We also have cool weather. Uh, rapeseed does not like hot weather. It is not grown in hot climates. It does not need high heat unit to work. So it's not like corn, it's not like soybeans. So that's, that's an oil crop that won't work in our, our constituency. But this one will. So then the war happened. And when the Second World War came, we suddenly had no source of uh, rapeseed oil for our industrial, our industrial uses. And of course, uh, World War II, the Canadians had a huge war effort on. Uh, they needed this, so the, the Dominion of Canada, as we were known, was looking around, what are we going to do? So they set, set about to develop an oil seed that we could do, uh, we could grow in, in Canada to help the war effort. They set Dr. William White uh, to be the Dominion of Canada oil seed breeder uh, at the forage breeding program, forage breeding station in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. 
He also established the National Science Council Oil Seed Lab, uh, probably one of the first labs of its kind in Canada. Uh, the NRC lab still runs there, the Canada Breeding Station still runs there. And they appointed Dr. Hank Salanz and, another group, and a, eventually a group of four scientists to work with the breeders on improving oil quality. And a lot of what they do and a lot of what the NRC group did was they invented boxes that went ping and helped advance things. So they created a lot of things that the breeders used to help identify oil and oil profiles. So here we are, my favorite picture. The Minion of Canada started collecting stats in uh, the early, early 1900. This is CanSIM chart 001010. It's one of the first databases collected by the Statistics Department of the Government of Canada. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible wealth of uh, knowledge. Now, if you look at this chart, you don't know what is on there because the things are rather stable. If you remember some of the charts from this morning, right? Population growth. Looks like the red one. It's just growing up. Uh, you think of uh, energy use, just like the red one. They all look the same. Well, for a lot of reasons, because we have a lot of population. So on this one, the red is total production of canola produced in Canada annually. The blue line is annual average yields from 1943 to 2016. It's a very solid, actually, it's a very solid piece of data. You'll see that on the yield side, three channels, 1,000 tons a hectare, you see there is a period of time where you're between 1,000 and 1,500 tons a hectare, and then you see we're over and approaching 2,000 tons a hectare. Very specific reasons for that to happen. Down here, we first get on the chart, they start collecting there, but we first pop up uh, 1950, in the 50s, when they first produced uh, 10,000 tons of canola annually in Canada. So at 43 is they started collecting data because we actually produced and sold 1,000 tons of rapeseed that year. 43, we also brought in the first varieties of napis into Canada. They brought it from Argentina. They, they plugged it around to a few farmers uh, close to uh, the station in Saskatoon, in southern Saskatchewan, to try and grow this brand new, this brand new canola, this brand new rapeseed, see how it worked. It worked fabulous. Uh, in fact, they were growing so good that by 1945, they established the first canola crusher, uh, prairie vegetable oils and moose jaw. A uh, local farmer, Jay Gordon Ross, was the first GM. The purpose there was to create rapeseed oil to sell to the military for the war effort. A few months later, the war ended, and things didn't turn out so well. So we had productions dropping. By 1946, they registered B-Rapa, otherwise known colloquially as Polish canola, because the foundation seeds came from Fred and Olga's farm. Uh, where the varieties that they were passing out was what actually got first, was got first registered and became the first registered Polish canola wrap of varieties. It wasn't until 54 that uh, Dr. White registered Golden, which was the first improved Napus variety. It uh, was the first variety that had really good lodging, it didn't fall over, and it had higher, uh, higher oil content, and uh, production really started to go. But you can see here after the war, not so much. Things didn't do, go too well. It still needed a lot of work uh, to keep going. Uh, by 57, uh, Dr. White retired, and Dr. Keith Downey took over his breeding program at, uh, at Saskatoon. And he was given the, the job of improving rapeseed. At the University of Manitoba in 1957, Dr. Balder Stephenson was employed to find an oil seed for the growers, farmers in the Manitoba region, so that they could have an alternative to wheat. Now you think back to the 40s and 50s, prior to 40s, the 1940s, almost all of agriculture in the prairies was organic. There was very little uh, nitrogen fertilizer used. There was almost no, uh, no herbicides used. Production values were falling. Uh, I mean, the, a lot of the farmland had been broken since the turn of the century or just prior to. A lot of the organic material had been used up. In the 30s, they had the dirty 30s because the soils were blowing away Things were not in a good shape. So they needed things to control weeds. They needed, they needed food for the plants. This is the way they went. So Balder, Stephenson, and Keith Downey are aware of each other. They know birds of a feather. They, look, they work together. But they're competing because they both have the same goals. So it was a unique relationship where they shared material, but they were competing to be the first to improve this crop and make it work. Meanwhile, at the research council, they came up with a couple of neat things. They came up with liquid gas chromatography. 
which they could use to determine fatty acid profiles. And they could look for ure uricic acid, which was the negative in rapeseed, and glucosinolates, another negative in rapeseed. And until they could actually find those in single seeds, they couldn't really improve at a very fast pace. So that invention itself really moved things forward because those guys could look at individual seeds and the way they, and the way they went. Meanwhile, in Winnipeg, a bunch of grain traders start the Winnipeg Commodity Exchange at the Winnipeg, they start the rapeseed futures contract. So we have a couple of points here, and APIS is up, the first crusher starts. Uh, Golden is, is, is put out there, it's one of the better first variety, low, low varieties. Downey and Stephenson start working together. We've got new technologies being invented that helps Downey move things faster. And he's, he's looking at some of these. And one of these things is collaborations. So Stephenson's in Europe, he finds a forage rapeseed that has less than 10% uricic acid. At this point in time, rapeseed is about 50% uricic acid. Uricic acid is actually deadly to humans in large in any quantities. So you can't eat it regularly. So finding something under 10% is actually quite a, an astounding discovery. So he moves it forward into his stuff. And he shares the stuff with, with, uh, with Downey. He comes home, he doesn't keep it. He shares it with his competitor. Downey finds some seeds, and he's going through individual seeds. And he finds one seed that has zero uricic acid in it. And he's using a new technology, a half seed breeding technique, split the seed in half, you test half the seed, you propagate the other half. He tests the seed, he finds no uricic acid. He propagates one plant, gets five seeds out of that plant, propagates those five seeds into a whole new race of plants. So in 71, they registered SPAN. This is all going on for the next 20 years. They register SPAN, which is the first ultra-low or low uricic acid rapeseed. By 73, the, the rapeseed crop is at about 3 million acres, uh, and almost all of it is now uricic acid. 74, what they did in SPAN, which was uh, a napus variety, they bring into Tower, which is Polish canola, and now they're looking for reduced glucosinolates. A Polish scientist uh, is visiting Downey, brings a sample of seeds, gives them to Keith. Keith is doing his stuff, finds one with zero gluc. Away they go, right? Serendipity. Just a guy comes for a visit. Oh, I brought you some, a present. And he finds a solution that creates the Canadian canola industry. It's, a, it's as simple as that. So here we have a couple of other things happened. By 67, the Rapeseed Association of Canada's forum, that's, the, that's a, a seminal moment in that a unique organization in Canada and possibly the world comes together. Uh, the farmers, crushers, by now there's a couple of crushers around the prairies. Uh, the seed developers, Balder Stephenson, Downey and others, and the farm organizations. By, by 67, there's rapeseed growing, rapeseed uh, grower associations across the prairies. All four of those groups get together form the Rapeseed Association of Canada with a single goal of improving rapeseed, making it better, improving the marketability, the profitability, and expanding this little crop into, uh, into an industry that everybody in the prairies can take advantage of. So that was 50 years ago. By 77, they find, they register uh, the double lows. They find double low zero, it's called Oro. They <coughs> register it. And off they go, a couple of other ones. By there's 77, there's zero napus. Now we're running into a bit of a flat line with yields. Can't, yields aren't improving, production's kind of uh, But they got disease issues, they have black leg, and they have weeds. They can't control weeds, they have no herbicide control for weeds. They got nothing they can use in crop. And they uh, serendipity again, in Quebec, the most unusual of places, uh, Mr. Holman uh, is harvesting his corn crop and finds that there's all these little yellow plants growing in his corn crop. He's growing atrazine tolerant corn. And he finds out that this is a, a bird rapeseed. So it's, it's a rapeseed bred for bird seed. Birds that spread in his crop, propagated with the, with the corn, uh, naturally mutated, and he discovered, found atrazine resistant rapeseed. Uh, some of the seeds were given to uh, Dr. Beversdorf 
at the University of Guelph, got them into the double low system, and you have Triton, the first double low zero rapeseed uh, in the world that is, now has a herb, can have a herbicide application. And you can kind of see that we get a bit of a production bump and a yield bump happening there. Now, it's important to notice that, to note that double O rapeseed, low uric acid, low gluc rapeseed, does not exist anywhere else in the world except Canada. No one else is, they're growing rapeseed, but they're not growing this stuff. They're not growing stuff that people can eat. They're still growing industrial lubricants. Uh, they're interested and they're watching what we're doing, but it's still relatively unique to the world. And at this point, Health Canada is getting involved and advising people that, you know, this, this is a really good oil uh, for vegetable oil, reduce saturated fat, car uh, there's cardiac health issues. Uh, they do a unique thing, some, some of these, nu these nutritionists uh, and, and human health researchers are doing human feeding trials. Anybody in the room involved in animal feeding trials? No one? Everybody left after Rich talked? Um, it's very easy. You get all your animals in a pen, you feed them all the same thing or different things, then you measure. Uh, humans, not so easy. There's ethics and stuff you have to watch out for. <laughs> but they started doing some of these things. And they're coming up with hard, uh, good, good hard evidence that there's beneficial health impacts to this. Uh, so they started actually putting together booklets uh, that they would send out to doctors and nurses about the benefits of canola oil. It's one of our first marketing programs, and it's the core activity that the canola industry has in promoting its core attribute is, is the healthfulness of the product. Uh, and it led to generally regarded as safe status happening in the United States in 85, which opened up the United States. Uh, basically, they said, it's vegetable oil safe for human consumption, and away we went. And the United States is now our single largest market for, for canola oil. Uh, a couple other things happened after that. Um, the next big thing to hit canola happened in, 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 the, in the 95, 96 time frame. You had, you had a couple, three, couple big developments. You had black leg tolerance by, by put into canola by Dr. Gary Stringham at the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Stringham's position, I see Stan is here, um, was a unique position because he was actually an Ag Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada employee, seconded to the University of Alberta. So you had two organizations collaborating on a position to breed uh, and improve canola. Uh, Quantum, that, that first variety, was astounding. At this point, Black Leg was, was knocking fields flat. There were horrendous lawsuits in, uh, between neighbors in certain parts of uh, Western Canada. You gave me Black Leg, you gave me Black Leg. No, I didn't. You're, you're just a bad farmer. It was really actually in some places very terrible. Dr. Kelly Turkington at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lacombe, he's a pathologist, he's just starting his career, was involved in this, uh, got the unfortunate nickname of being called Dr. Death because he identified black leg in some of these fields. Uh, I don't think he's ever, uh, he does a lot of barley research now, so <laughs> it's, it, it's not good. But we also had uh, transgenic herbicide resistance. Transgenic is, it, is the mechanism by which it happened. It's a, it's a glyphosate glyphosate uh, products that were their broad herbicide tolerance. They could really control weeds in canola now. Uh, then we really saw production spike. We, re we really saw a lot of things go on there. Uh, it, the management of it became a lot easier. You really contributed to minimal till. We really saw uh, direct seeding take off after that because it could be easily adopted in some, some parts of the province where minimal till wasn't so easy uh, when you had heavier wet soils or, or higher residue issues. Um, it, it became a problem, but that made it easier. It made it a lot easier. You could control weeds and subsequent crops. It was generally a good thing. How GMO happened? Another one of those serendipitous type things, two researchers in the States working together, they discover a mechanism by which they could transfer genes. It was a university academic and it was a private sector individual. The academic wrote the paper, the private sector guy went and got the patent. You've probably heard about the Monsanto fight ever since. And, and that kind of went forward. But it was, it, was a, it was a control, it was a problem that got solved. 
the next big thing that happened was the, was the advent and introduction of hybrid canola. Canola is not a plant that lends itself to hybridity. Uh, so being able to do that in a, in a mechanism, and they, yes, they used a transgenic solution to make it, the initial ones happen, really increased the potential for genetic expression in the plant. And the greatest marketing event to ever happen to the canola industry happened at the same time, the O2 drought. Now, how they planned it, I don't know. But in that year, uh, some of you that have, are, are, might remember that, <coughs> Alberta had no rain up until July, zero rain. Uh, some areas of the province had less than two inches of rain. Uh, some of the farmers that were on my board of directors at that time got an inch and a half of rain in July and pulled 15 bushels an acre of Invigor canola off their, their land. Totally sold, not growing anything else ever again but this. The ability to withstand stress, to beat back weeds, uh, was a big leap. Uh, it really worked. And, and that was kind of the last big, and you can, last big one. Now you can see that happened there. We see big production. But more important, this yield increase is happening because of that. Part of this increase here is, uh, as Rich said, they lost some of the cattle herd. Uh, cattle guys were looking to replace their revenues from their cattle acres. Uh, so they moved out of the feed grains business and they moved into the canola business. It's a little bit easier than the, than the, than the cattle guy, than, than feeding cattle, so they stayed. But a lot of this is all, like I said, you look at the population growth, this is a demand pull industry. We're not producing stuff just because. We're producing stuff because people want it and they're willing to pay for it. And that's really how things, how things have been moved along over time. And, and this is kind of how the structure uh, of the industry is right now. From the Canola Council standpoint, you have uh, the grower organizations in the provinces, BC, uh, Ontario, three prairie provinces. We also form the Canola Council of Canada, national farm organization representing uh, canola growers nationally. You might also have heard about them. They run the cash advance program for a bunch of grains. But we also still have the, the Canola Council of Canada, the life science companies, the crushers, the exporters, and the farmers, all sectors standing around. And their sole goal is to uh, increase and move forward the industry, the canola industry. Um, we've had some, some interesting times. They, uh, we've had some challenges. Uh, but when they're having challenges, the four sectors put aside competitive issues to solve a problem. So it helps with trade. Uh, you know, we saw last year with the, the issue with China, the sector kind of got behind that. It helps with MRL issues. It helps with, uh, with, with accessing markets and it, ha ha it helps with accessing science. And, and I want to end with that because some of the speakers this morning were very Malthusian in their discussions. The world's going to end, we're all going to starve. Uh, I think, I can't remember which one, all economic activity in the world is going to stop. Okay, okay, I challenged that one. But we've, as I pointed out, we've hit in the canola industry in the last 50 years some several significant, and we're up against uh, some more significant challenges. But we scienced our way out of it. And that's what will happen. And that's what proved Malthus wrong. We scienced our way out of these problems. Uh, maybe they created more problems, I don't know. That's a philosophy debate, but that's going to be our solution. Otherwise, we might as well all just stop.